Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar talking about careers in child and family psychology. My name is Sarah Johansson, and I work in the marketing department here at William James College. Um, so I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'll give a little bit of an overview of William James College, go through a few housekeeping things, and then we can get into the presentation today. So we can move on to the next slide. And today you'll be hearing from Dr. Robert Kincher, who is our Associate Vice President for the Department of Community Engagement, as well as a professor in the Clinical Psychology Department. Um, he teaches in the Children and Families of Adversity and Resilience Concentration and the Forensic Psychology Concentration. Um, we also have Dr. Bruce Ecker here today, who is an Associate Professor in the Clinical Psychology Department and Co-Director of the Youth and Family Psychotherapy Service. Um, he's the project director of the Graduate Psychology Education and Opioid Workforce Expansion Training Grant, and he's also a faculty member in the Children and Families of Adversity and Resilience Concentration. Um, so we have two great presenters today talking about the subject, um, and we can move on to the next slide. And you'll be also hearing from Joseph Lush, who is our Associate Director of Admissions, um, who will cover a little bit of the admissions process to William James College. Um, so on the next slide, um, just want to give you a little bit of an overview, as I mentioned, of the college. So you can see there on the map that we're located in Newton, Massachusetts, um, which is just outside of Boston. Um, you can see there that we're easily accessible from a number of major highways. It makes it easy for our students to get to campus when they need to, when we're safely able to come to campus. Um, and we also have a lot of great opportunities in Boston, in the Boston area, for our students to have internships, field placement practicum, um, different connections with organizations in the area. Um, experiential education is really a key part of all of our academic programs. Um, and we really have all of our students right from day one, you know, putting into practice in the field what they're learning in the classroom. So um, we're really glad to have such a connection um, to some great organizations in the area. On the next slide, um, I'm just going to go through a little bit um, of technical things before we can turn things over to our presenters today. So first, as you know, this is a live webinar and we really want you to be able to get the most out of it while you're here and while you have all of us um, live. So at any point throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit any questions you have into the question box. Um, this could be anything you need more clarification on, something you're confused about, um, want more information about. So you really uh, want to make sure we can get those questions answered for you. Um, there'll be a, a time towards the end of the presentation um, for a Q&A. So throughout the presentation, definitely um, submit those there. Um, I also want to add that in the handout section, you can download all of the slides from today, um, as well as some uh, application information. So those are some great resources, and I encourage you to take a moment to do that. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Drs. Kinchurf and Ecker. Good day. It's a pleasure to be able to sit with you a bit here on the webinar and talk with you about uh, psychological services for uh, children and families. Uh, Bruce and I are going to uh, speak to you together, but we've decided to kind of break the talk up uh, and I'll take the lead for a while and he'll a chime in as as is warranted and then he'll take the lead for a while and then we'll wrap up and have some time to uh, interact with you which i think is probably the most important part of this uh, is to be able to respond to any uh, questions that you might have robert the, you, uh, wanna, i want to jump in and say hi as well i'm bruce ecker and robert you think we should do some some additional introductions sure why don't you go ahead and start bruce tell them a little bit about yourself so first of all, I'd, I'd like to um, add my welcome to Robert's and to Joe's and to Sarah's and say that I'm very glad you've joined us here today. Um, I've been uh, uh, an instructor, an associate professor at William James now for 14 years. Um, this is uh, follows or goes in part tandem with a 35 year history of um, helping children, adolescents and their families um, meet the needs that they have in coping with this world of ours. Um, I very much enjoy integrating my experience from doing clinical work with my understanding of the research um, literature in teaching. So that's, what, that's why I'm at William James and uh, I welcome your interest. 
and I'll, I'll leave that for now, leave more for later. And uh, I'm Robert again, and I, I started uh, years ago uh, with my training, uh, having no idea that I would end up spending my career uh, doing work with children and families. If somebody had told me before I got to graduate school that that's what I would have ended up doing, I would have been entirely surprised that they would have had such a silly notion. But the truth of the matter is that um, I've now been doing this work for over 30 years, and I am glad that I've had the opportunity to do this, partly because of its challenge, um, partly because of the vibrant nature of the research that's been emerging over the course of my career, better and better ways to help children, and because I can't think of a better domain for actually um, aligning with the mission of the school, which is uh, meeting the needs, making a difference. And we've entitled this slide, uh, The Unmet Need, and you probably had a chance to read it while we've been introducing ourselves. But you can see that there is a terrific prevalence of unmet behavioral health needs amongst children, and especially uh, for uh, children across age range, but especially in uh, adolescence. So for example, those who have had a major depressive episode, only 40% have received treatment for what can be a quite disabling and persisting condition. And although children as a group, children and adolescents as a group are less likely to have their behavioral health needs met, this is particularly the case of uh, children of color uh, from ethnic minority groups. And uh, in fact, they're the least likely to receive care it is absolutely needed. Next slide. This data from Massachusetts in 2017, you can see that over a quarter of teens have reported a depressive pattern of uh, feeling sad and hopeless in the, most of the past two weeks. This is from a behavioral health survey that's done annually across the United States. This is Massachusetts data. And this is a significant increase since 2013. And you can see that this is not just feeling down or blue or having a bad day, um, in that over 10%, one out of 10 of teens reported having uh, injured themselves purposefully without wanting to kill themselves, but as a manner, a, manner, a, a way of, of coping with their emotional distress. But one in 10 have. Uh, reported seriously considering suicide. And we know that since 2017, and especially since the onset of the pandemic, uh, we've seen increases of this kind of depression, self-injury, and suicide, um, thinking about it and attempting it, which is up uh, 37% since 2000 and 2017, and higher even then, even since then. Next slide. Most people would think that medical conditions are the single most expensive kinds of child illnesses, uh, but in fact, nationally, behavioral health disorders are the single most expensive cost center for children who are impaired, and especially uh, uh, youth who have trauma-related conditions, a relatively small percentage of the population, but really quite expensive in terms of the uh, care that they, they need. The only thing that is more expensive than providing them the care that they need is failing to provide them the care that they need. And children in on Medicaid, uh, they're 10% of the enrollment on Medicaid, but over half of total Medicaid expenses of both medical and behavioral health. And we know that medical and behavioral health expenses are tightly intertwined. Next slide, please. Even in Massachusetts, which has the highest per capita uh, prevalence of licensed mental health professionals, access to care for children, especially in Massachusetts, is limited by waiting lists and the travel distance to, to resources. And there are, uh, you know, almost two thirds of Massachusetts parents who waited up to three months to see a mental health clinician for their child. And periods, uh, wait periods of three months, five months, nine months, depending upon the part of the state that you're in, is, is not uncommon and they have to travel some significant distance. This has traveled 30 to 60 minutes. This data, if my recollection is correct, is by car. So you can imagine what this would be for public transportation. When they do get care, it's often inadequate. It's uh, uh, too, uh, too little 
for the, the trouble that they are in and less than the recommended number for nearly all of the evidence-based treatments. So one way to think about this is if this was a medical condition, they're, they're underdosed. And so as a result, many of them don't benefit as much as they could from the exposure. And for those of you who are entering the field, um, a lot of us are getting to the point of retirement and the majority of behavioral health providers in Massachusetts who primarily serve children are over 55 years of age. Next slide. Robert, if I could jump in for a second. Sure. It is these kinds of data that Robert just presented to us that make me honestly thrilled that you've joined this webinar today. Because by joining this webinar, you're showing that you are um, interested in helping to solve this problem, these problems. There are many problems, um, but there are lots of kids who are hurting. There are even more kids who are hurting because of the pandemic. Um, and these kids have families and schools and communities. Um, and I'm so glad that, that you're interested um, in thinking about a career in which you can, I see the next slide here, in which you can make a difference in their lives. And Bruce and I can both assure you that you actually do make a difference and an enduring dif dif difference. And for some uh, children and adolescents, uh, quite literally a life-saving difference. And so we're absolutely thrilled that you're here. You can see kind of a, an overview of the way in which you can make a difference, your pathway. Uh, your desire and your experience, which you have shaped in your undergraduate education, and for some of you, uh, perhaps in some post-baccalaureate life experience or master's level training. And we are eager to provide you with hands-on, very rich, high-level graduate training, both in coursework and in field work that will help you chart your career. And we'll be talking in a moment about the diversity of careers serving children, youth, and families. Uh, that, that you can choose. I just want to emphasize that literally from your first days at William James College, you will be in the field uh, working with clients and patients in a variety of different settings. This is a very hands-on uh, uh, training program uh, where much of what you will learn will not be uh, in, in the classroom. It will be in the field and informed by the work that you do in the classroom. Next slide, please. The combination of that coursework and that field work uh, gives you a great deal of pragmatic clinical experience and training. We do very, very well with placements. We do very, very well with employment uh, following graduation from William James College. People typically are able to find the kind of work, the kind of job they find immensely satisfying, including in the areas that touch upon uh, work with children, youth, and their families. Do you want to add anything there, Bruce? I think you, you said it beautifully, Robert, exactly. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Um, I don't see numbers on the slides. Where are, where are we? Uh, we're on the uh, making a difference uh, slide, uh, Dr. Kinsher, if we're talking about uh, the differences between the- No, I, un I, I, under I understand the content. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ecker and I had uh, divided them up by number, but the oh, slides sorry. Uh, don't have the numbers on them. So I'll, I'll wander until um, okay. it's like time to pass the talking stick to Bruce. Whatever you like, Robert. Okay. So the model of child behavioral health training uh, that we follow uh, goes in a variety of different tracks. Uh, in the clinical PsyD program, uh, we don't do the PhD, we do the PsyD, and if you have any questions about the differences or the utility of one versus the other, we'd be glad to respond to that. But clinical training at the doctoral level, and here you're really sort of thinking about child clinical work and some people doing, sometimes calling it pediatric psychology, it goes by various names, but it's basically the core training in child and family development, uh, diagnosis, treatment, assessment, and the like. People sometimes pursue a counseling master's, which in Massachusetts uh, results in the LMHC license. Some people pursue social work, and some people go uh, through school psychology training programs at different levels, a master's, a graduate certification, or a doctoral level degree. Next slide, please. 
And there are a variety of different settings in which you can train and contribute while you're training and then uh, find your careers. So this is just uh, a, a chart with various examples. Uh, Bruce and I have trained or worked in many of these. I have spent most of my time in my career um, in residential treatment centers, um, in medical and psychiatric hospitals. I have uh, a career interest, a longstanding and, and practice in uh, juvenile forensic psychology and worked for many years in the juvenile court system. In Massachusetts, uh, we hold the contract for the juvenile court clinics in, contra in uh, Suffolk County and Norfolk County, which is basically Metro Boston. Uh, those are operated uh, by William James College. But as you can see, there, has, uh, there are opportunities in primary medical care that has been increasing in recent years, and people who spend time in academic and research areas, um, sometimes like Bruce and I, doing academic work and research work as well as uh, clinical work in various settings. Next slide, please. I'd like to follow up. We can go back, Joe. Sorry about that. Uh, um, so it's interesting, Robert, when you present this, I think between the two of us, we've covered just about all of these. Um, I've worked in an outpatient clinic, a psychiatric hospital, a medical hospital. I've done work um, in an integrated primary care pediatrics office. Um, I've consulted in residential treatment centers, and I've both worked and consulted in schools. Uh, one of the things, as Robert said, you get at William James is um, folks, instructors, professors who have done the clinical work that they're teaching. Some of us for, for many years, some of us for a few years. There's a wide range of ages and interests on the faculty. Um, but we know, we know what it's like to do this work. We pass on what we know and we appreciate the research literature as well. So it's really a wonderful combination of those. And feel free to, yep. to advance. And at William James, you'll get the broad uh, training that you need that will be flexible enough for you to craft your own career pathway that will lead you to or through many of these kinds of settings over the course of your career. Next slide, please. Many paths to go. I'll, I'll give you an example of one or two. Um, one pathway is the um, uh, going through the master's degree, and here at William James, we offer uh, the master's in counseling psychology. There you will learn evaluation, counseling, and psychotherapy, consultation practice, which is an increasingly important part of behavioral health practice, have the opportunity to look at public policy and the way in which it shapes our caregiving environments and the impact of public policy on the well-being of children and their families, and can help you if you want to develop a career in at teaching at the associate's bachelor's and master's level. We also have a program in applied behavior analysis. This is particularly well suited for interventions with uh, developmentally disabled and intellectually disabled individuals, interventions with d disruptive behavior disorders, and there are jobs available in clinics, uh, in-home services, and in schools uh, for somebody with uh, a background in ABA. Next slide, please. School psychology uh, has its emphasis on supporting children and adolescents where they spend most of their time. And school psychologists can have terrific impact in school environments and help teachers and educational administrators understand the children that they are most concerned about. Sometimes, for example, it's important for teachers to know that they're not dealing with a willful um, child who is simply being difficult and disobedient, they're actually watching a child who's depressed or who has, is substantially traumatized or is coping with exposure to domestic or community violence when they're not in school. This allows a uh, uh, flexibility to school psychology where you can focus on academics, helping uh, identify and respond to learning disabilities, for example, as well as a child's social and emotional adjustment. Next slide. And after this one, I'll turn the talking stick over to you, Bruce. The doctoral degree can have different areas of focus, counseling, school, and clinical psychology here at William James. Uh, our programs are in school and clinical psychology at the doctoral level. 
The doctoral lo lo level degree is incredibly flexible because its scope of practice once you're licensed includes counseling and psychotherapy, uh, psychological and neuropsychological testing, you have the ability to develop uh, specific and extensive skills in that, especially if you are interested in being uh, primarily an assessment psychologist, consultation and supervision, research, teaching, public policy. In some of our courses, uh, we are mindful about teaching uh, our clinical psychology students how to understand public policy, how it's developed, and how to be effective advocates at the policy level leadership and administration, and uh, applying psychology in courts, um, in detention facilities, in specialized treatment programs for persons with offensive hi histories or persons who are in high conflict divorce, and of course, correctional psychology in uh, prisons. Next slide. Bruce, why don't you take it? Um, as Robert said, there are many paths to a career um, in psychology, and I'm going to speak now about the doctoral path a bit more and the doctoral program that we offer at William James College. It is a five-year program that leads to licensure. Um, we are well aware that you enter a, a doctoral program to learn as much as you can and to develop the knowledge and skills to be helpful, but also we're very mindful of your need for employment. So everybody leaves um, in a circumstance that they will be eligible for licensure. Um, we provide our primary grounding, which is in practice, but there's emphasis also in research and what research teaches us. Um, as we mentioned before, one of our hallmarks is that classwork and fieldwork are integrated from virtually the first day that, that, that we start together. Um, everyone has field work every one of their years, and there are many, many field settings that I'll speak about a bit more um, in a few minutes. And um, virtually all of our graduates are employed in their intended field. Uh, I think the most recent survey we found was that 93% of graduates um, have full employment within the first six months um, post-graduation. And I would imagine the other 7% um, are likely interested in doing some other things, and that's why they're not employed, because there is tremendous need. Next for slide. example, yeah. for example, some will uh, choose to get additional postdoctoral training in something like neuropsychology or forensic psychology. So they've graduated from us, and they're not technically in the, the job market, if you will, uh, but they are acquiring additional skills in nationally competitive postdoctoral training programs. Thank you. Um, within the Department of Clinical Psychology, within the doctoral program, we have a very vibrant concentration called Children's and Families of Adversity and Resilience. Um, this concentration is just shy of 10 years old, actually a little less, started in 2011. And um, just about anywhere you go, there is a child clinical concentration. But honestly, this one is special, and it's special in a few ways. Um, you notice that we talk about children and families. We can't think about children without also thinking about the context in which they live, primarily families. Um, and we can't think about families without thinking about the individual children and adolescents who are within them. So that's one, one key feature. The second key feature is that we think about lives as being composed of adversity and resilience. The struggles that we all face, and unfortunately some of us face much greater struggles, and resilience, which is how can we build the protective factors within children, families, and communities that will help them um, overcome the adversities that they experience um, and at times even thrive following adversity. Um, we intended this concentration to meet the, need, the training needs of people who wish to work with kids who have large adversities in their lives, who struggle with medical difficulties, community difficulties, um, serious psychiatric disorders, all kinds of, of struggles. Um, and we think that we're doing a very good job with it. So we're, we're proud. Um, I can say Robert was the first person to develop that this concentration and I was its director for seven years. So we know it well. Okay, I, I, I mentioned this already, um, these key concepts. So I'll give you a moment to read those slides and then we'll move on, this slide, and then we'll move on. I just want to emphasize that unlike some programs that, that do have child psychology, 
we're very mindful that children need to be seen in the context of their social ecology systems uh, in which they are embedded and which interact with them. So it's not just about getting a, uh, a testing battery uh, that will give you a picture of the, the cognitive capacities of an individual child or awarding a child a diagnosis. Uh, knowing a child, for example, is depressed, uh, that tells you something about their diagnosis, that tells you something about their symptoms. It tells you almost nothing about the context in which that child is depressed um, and the resiliencies and strengths that can be mobilized uh, and, and, and need to be nurtured as part of a clinical treatment plan as much as we would pay attention to their symptoms. Um, we are a concentration that has grown over the years. And um, you can see when we started, we have 12 students. Um, when we created this slide in 2018, there were 42. Uh, it is quite a popular and, as I said, vibrant concentration within William James College. And this kind of growth has continued to, um, to date. Next slide. Uh, so when you come to, to William James College, the WJC, there's the academic program, and you'll take lots of classes. And there's your field work. And there are a lot of other resources. And that's what I'm going to speak about now. First off, in terms of the field work, um, we have, it's, it's over this number, 200, over 240 field work sites with whom we have agreements. So these are training agreements where there are explicit goals and explicit requirements to make the, the trainee experience, your experience as students, a rich and rewarding one. So that's- I think, we're, I yeah. think we're actually north of 300 sites, field sites now. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, the faculty is highly experienced and we're really broad and diverse. We're diverse in terms of our backgrounds, we're diverse in terms of our clinical experience, we're diverse in terms of our race, in terms of our ethnicity, certainly gender. Um, you can find just about any kind of resource you want within our very large and, um, and giving faculty. We're very generous faculty. Um, it is a condition of our employment that we are available to you um, as advisors, as teachers, uh, as mentors, as informal guides, and as supports. So that's the faculty. And then we also have some service branches within the college um, where students get very valuable experience. Um, first is the Friedman Center for Child and Family Development, which does a number of uh, things. Um, they um, offer groups for mothers and their newborns. They offer play groups for young children. And when I say young, there's one group for kids up to a year and another group for kids up to four years of age. Um, they have a call and referral service, which is incredibly valuable. Um, something we hear over and over again from parents and other caregivers is they have a, a child who's in need and they call one clinician and the clinician says they have no space. And they call another clinician and that clinician says, sorry, I'm all booked up. And it's very difficult to get the care that children need. So we've developed a service called Interface in which parents, caregivers, and at times clinicians can call in, say, there's this child, this child is, is, is um, really struggling, seems depressed, has talked about suicide, is getting in fights, whatever it happens to be, and the interface service will find an available clinician and make a connection between the clinician, the child, and the family. It's a very valuable service. I'll run down some others. The Brenner Center for Psychological Assessment is a large center that provides assessment and consultation services to the region broadly, um, and um, students, trainees, do all the work under close supervision and they are practicum students, intern, um, interns, and postdoctoral fellows. The Pathways program serves um, kids who um, either have frequent absences or have gotten into um, a lot of uh, multiple suspensions in, and um, from Boston Public Schools and meets these kids where they are to understand their struggles in life. And interesting, we have found that most of these kids that are seen as problems, the, really, the real issue is that they have problems. Um, many of these kids have um, psychiatric disorders, have a history of trauma, and really are struggling 
um, with a lot in their lives. And that's the reason that they're not doing as well as school in school as everyone would, would hope. Um, so that's the Pathways program. We have the Youth and Family Psychotherapy Set Service, which is a training clinic that we have right at William James um, at, that provides culturally informed evidence-based practice, evidence-based services for children and families. Um, we have a really wonderful center for multicultural and global mental health, which houses a number of, of concentrations, the African and Caribbean concentration, um, a Latino mental health concentration, and a general multicultural and global mental health concentration. And this concentration has really changed the culture of William James. We have become more and more appreciative um, of the diversity of people and cultures who we wish to bring through our doors. Um, and we have come, become more and more celebrants of our differences and our diversity. And um, that has a lot to do with this CMGMH, Center for Multicultural and Global Mental Health. Um, we also have an American Psychological Association accredited internship within um, William James College. And to support that, we've been very successful um, in receiving grants from the um, Department of Health and Human Services, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, grants that have totaled $4.6 million um, over the past six years. And we support many students with those funds. And um, we're very proud of this. These are, these are grants that no more than 20 or 30 uh, graduate programs across the country have received. And we've received um, four of these in those past six years. Plus, we just received two additional grants, which are not try, tied to training, but are grants to support those students um, who come to William James with the firm intention of serving the underserved. Um, and we're really, really thrilled with that. They're called Star Fellows. Um, and Robert, I noticed that the Juvenile Court Clinic is not on this list. So if you want to add anything about that. Uh, just to say that um, we operate uh, juvenile court clinics for the two counties I mentioned before, Suffolk County and uh, Norfolk County, which is basically Metro Boston. The people who are there are uh, clinicians who are uh, William James employees. They provide court-ordered evaluations for the juvenile courts in child abuse and neglect cases, uh, so-called status offender cases like runaways, sexually exploited minor, truant, and the like, uh, delinquency cases. They also do involuntary um, commitments for emergency psychiatric uh, treatment or substance abuse treatment. It's a very vibrant training program with internship rotations um, and postdoctoral slots. Um, and many of the students who are particularly interested in uh, the forensic side of uh, child and family work uh, arrange to have training rotations there. It's a, it's a terrific resource. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, here we are. Um, this is a few years ago, and it's interesting to see this because many of the people in this picture who graduated roughly 2016, 2015 are supervisors in the field. Um, you'll see here a group of faculty and students together, um, supervisor in the field, leaders um, in the field of child and family psychology. Um, it's, um, it's great for me to see this, to be reminded um, uh, the, these pe wonderful people with wonderful capabilities. Um, and we are really making that difference that we intend. I believe there's another slide, a bit more recent. Um, we uh, present conferences from time to time. Um, you can see we are a mixed group and we're very proud of that. And um, once you get to know us, you'll see we're mixed in many ways. Um, and That's Dr. Ecker is the very handsome fellow there in the red tie. <laughs> and Dr. Kinsher, you must be taking the picture. It must have been taking the picture. <laughs> so. And we welcome your questions about anything that has to do with child and family psychology, uh, um, doctoral level, master's level, school level, or any questions you have about William James College. Thank you both for that great presentation. Um, we already have a couple of questions. 
Um, anyone else who has questions, feel free to just send those through the question box, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, and we'll go through a few of those uh, now. So we have a question here that says, I've heard of child therapists becoming LMFTs and noticed that degree wasn't on your slide. What are your thoughts about that degree for child psychology? Robert, you want to take that or should I? Why don't you, why don't you start? Okay, and if there's anything, please add anything you'd like to. Um, so I believe we do have a program that trains LMFTs. It's part of our bachelor's, I'm sorry, that was a mistake, master's in counseling program. Um, and th that is a, a degree, that's a license really, not, not a degree, a license that um, is emphasized in some states and not much emphasized in others. For example, it's very common in California, I know, um, and it seems not as common in Massachusetts. Uh, but we do, I believe, have an LMFT program. Robert, do you know more about that? Yes, there are LMFT um, uh, coursework and field sites in our master's program. Um, we also train you with, with the skills that you would expect in somebody who's an LMFT. Uh, if you're interested in that at the at the doctoral level in Massachusetts, it's typically not a separate degree. It's a uh, license, as as Bruce was mentioning. So somebody with a master's degree or a doctoral degree who has done the requisite kind of training and coursework uh, would look to be licensed. There are many people in Massachusetts who hold a master's or a doctoral uh, level license but also have a separate uh, recognition, uh, licensure recognition for LMFT. Yes, folks, I would uh, just like to add uh, to that question uh, that um, uh, our program at the master's level is a dual licensure program. Uh, so it, we offer a 60 credit master of arts program in clinical mental health counseling and the um, the couples and family uh, area of emphasis uh, is the um, is the option where students can enroll in that emphasis, and uh, they basically, uh, when they graduate from our program, uh, they receive all of the educational requirements for two licenses: the LMHC and also the LMFT, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist uh, credential. Thank you, Joe. Very informative. Okay, great. Um, so in the presentation today, you covered um, a number of different degree programs that we offer here at William James College. What would you say to someone who maybe only knows that they want to focus in children and families or have that, um, you know, discipline, but are not sure what degree program would be would be best? Do you have any advice for figuring out, um, you know, what program to enroll in? I'd be happy to start this, Robert, yeah, unless you... Go ahead. So, so this is a great question. Um, and it's a great question because you have lots of good options. Uh, and I think um, taking time to explore your... To think about... When I say explore, I mean, think about your interests. Um, and also think about your resources um, would um, apply to this. Let me say what I mean by that. Um, so... I consider thinking first about master's or a doctoral level. And you can make wonderful contributions to children, families, agencies, communities uh, with a master's degree. But your scope of practice is not as broad as if you have a doctoral degree. The scope of practice with a master's degree is primarily um, counseling or psychotherapy and consultation. Um, with a doctoral degree, that includes those two. And I would say there, there's some wonderful therapists um, with master's degree and consultants with master's degree. They aren't necessarily any less good than somebody with a doctoral degree. Um, but with a doctoral degree, it includes those functions, but you can add the functions of uh, um, psychological testing or assessment. Um, you have broader options in terms of research and teaching. Um, and you're more likely to be in a supervisory or administrative role um, with a doctoral degree. So one thing is about the scope of practice. Um, second is about the kind of setting in which you wish to work. Um, and I'll use myself as an example. I originally got a degree in school psychology because I was very interested in looking at the way that schools 
could be a, a venue for reform in our society. Um, and I worked as a school psychologist for a while and then decided that I was also very much interested in clinical encounters, in doing more psychotherapy and more consultation. Um, so I started all over again in a clinical degree, um, and which allows has allowed me to work in hospitals, clinics, do some consultation in schools, um, and in a private practice. Um, and that's a question of where you, you most want to apply the skills and knowledge that you have. Uh, so whether it be in a school or a clinic or a hospital. Um, and I'll, I'll pass on to you, Robert. Share some of your thoughts, and I may come back again. Sure. Um, if you also happen to have an interest in uh, the intersection of uh, behavioral health and the courts, um, which degree you have uh, will make a difference. So this might be a very you know small number of people that this applies to uh, in the world of uh, juvenile and family forensics. But uh, if you would like to do things like court-ordered evaluations or do evaluations uh, uh, for legally involved matters, then the degree of preference will be at the doctoral level. And for some kinds of jobs, like the juvenile court clinic jobs uh, or the adult court clinic jobs or forensic uh, hospital jobs, um, while there are people with master's degrees who operate inside of those services, um, they're restricted from doing some kinds of evaluations or doing some kinds of work inside of that setting. Um, it's a little more flexible in family law than it is in criminal uh, or juvenile delinquency law or uh, things like involuntary civil commitments of various kinds, uh, but uh, but not much. And so. Uh, if you really are interested in forensics, you'd, you'd want to think through what kind of setting you would want to be in. That being said, if you're interested in correctional settings or, or non-court forensic settings, um, there are many people with master's degrees who are there, um, but they are largely doing uh, the therapeutic interventions with the individuals with whom they are working. I want to add something also, thank you, Robert. I want to add something also about resources, which I mentioned briefly at the beginning, but didn't add on. Um, a, a master's degree typically takes two years. Um, a doctoral degree typically takes four years plus a year of internship. Um, the year of internship is a paid year, so I won't consider that in what I'm going to say now, but you have to, ha you have to apply, use more resources to get a doctoral degree than to get a master's degree. Um, you need to pay more tuition, basically. Basically twice the amount of tuition because it's twice the number of years. Now, I say that, but I also want to caution that we are very fortunate in William James in that we can support approximately 30 students a year with very major scholarships, scholarships that cover the majority of their costs. So we're really happy about that. Um, in addition, there are work study opportunities. They don't come even close to covering your costs, but they help. So lots of people do work study or are research assistants or are teaching assistants. So there are ways to do that. Um, most graduate students, I'm sorry to say, take out loans, and I'm sorry to say because nobody likes to borrow money, but it's, it seems um, necessary in this world to do so for, for most people. Um, and we have a good financial aid office that helps you with all of this. I would I would add on to that. Yes, people do take out loans and they graduate with some degree of debt, uh, but our default rate is extremely low, meaning that when people do take out loans, they're not. Uh, it, it's very uncommon that they're in the position that they can't um, make loan payments in a timely fashion. So. Uh, they are taking on debt, but they're able to get the kinds of jobs that allow them to manage it until the debt is paid off uh, with, a very, with our very, very low default rate. 
Yes, I would uh, I would add to that uh, that uh, the default rate is somewhere between I think one and two percent, which is a, a very low uh, you know rate. If you uh, if you look at uh, default rates for other uh, institutions, other graduate programs, uh, the rate is typically higher. So I think that's a a strong testimony uh, to the uh, employment market, uh, but also to the uh, ability of our graduates to uh, to you know secure immediate employment. Okay, great. Think, Thank you all for. Uh, well, let me just oh, add one other thing, Sarah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I think this is particularly pertinent to people who want to work with uh, children and families, because uh, the overwhelming majority of people who at, the, at both the masters and the uh, doctoral level um, who graduate and get licensed primarily serve a, adult populations. Uh, that's not a judgment, that's just an observation. What that means is that there are even more opportunities for employment because children and families are so uh, substantially underserved as we you know, we started talking about at the beginning of this session today. So uh, I, I think if you're sort of taking the long view, uh, if you're interested in working with children and families in almost any setting you can think of, uh, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Okay, great. Um, so switching gears a little bit to uh, the concentrations, um, are you able to have more than one concentration? Uh, for example, if someone was interested in CIFAR, but also in maybe one of the CMGMH concentrations that you had mentioned? Uh, this is Bruce. I'll jump in. Absolutely. Um, we have many people who do that. Um, and uh, we work with you from the beginning to uh, coordinate the time, the, your timing of taking courses. Um, so that you could fulfill requirements for both. And I'll take the flip side of that question. You're not required uh, to take a concentration. So if none of them are your cup of tea or you have other things you have to pay attention to in your life, um, then then that's fine as well. But we do have people who have one and, and two concentrations. Okay. Um, so a few times throughout the, the webinar, you mentioned the, the various... Um, field work examples, different places that um, people have, have had practicum experiences. Could you talk a little bit about the field ed department and how the process works for, you know, finding a placement site? I can start with that also, Robert. Go uh, ahead. Um, it varies year by year. Uh, and so, for example, this is, a, I'll talk first about the doctoral program. Um, in the first year, uh, once you're admitted, uh, the field ed department reaches out to you, gets to know you, and provides you with five options. Um, and you can you contact the options, and there is a, an interview a selection process that the field site works with you. But our field ed department, which is relatively large, we have um, four licensed psychologists. I think I'm right about this. Four licensed psychologists and three three very capable um, su administrative support staff who work with them. Um, so they really work closely with, very closely with you for that first year. Then as it comes to the second year, you take on more of that yourself because you know the system, you kind of know the process, um, and you make the choices yourself. We support you in doing it. If anybody needs support in putting together CVs or resumes, we offer that help. Um, you have an advisor that you see a few times a semester who's really dedicated to your success. This is a faculty member, and everybody has one. Everybody has an advisor, and the advisor helps you choose which sites to apply to. So that would be for second year. Third year, you take on even a little more um, responsibility, and so it goes um, till you're through the program. Um, I hope I answered that sufficiently. If not, please um, add additional question to it. The bottom line is that the field ed uh, is dedicated to supporting you in identifying and acquiring uh, field ed sites. And quite frankly, they, they don't give up on folks. If people don't get their first choice, they stick with you uh, until uh, you, you find a place to be. And there because there's so many choices, uh, People are remarkably successful in finding their ways to field placement sites that they find rewarding and rich experiences. And I'll say one 
um, one more item with this, one a few more words with this. Um, the diversity of field sites is absolutely amazing. Um, we have field sites geographically from Concord, New Hampshire, to Providence, Rhode Island, though most of them are in, in the close Boston metro, metropolitan area, and we go as far west as Worcester. And these are hospitals, community health centers, community mental health centers, schools, um, court clinics. Um, I'm sure there are many others that I'm not even thinking now, but there's really a rich diversity of places with a rich diversity of emphases, uh, and it's, it's really something. Okay, thank you both. Um, as we're kind of getting towards the uh, top of the hour, I think we can move on and um, I will turn things over to Joseph Lesh. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you to Dr. Kinsherf and Dr. Ecker for a wonderful presentation. Uh, so let's uh, switch gears for a moment here and I wanna speak to those of you who are attending today who might be considering an application for admission uh, to William James College. And I just wanna offer a brief overview of the application process that you would follow for becoming a student here. And then I'll also outline for you the basic contents of your application portfolio. So before we talk about the basics of preparing an application portfolio, I just wanna offer a quick overview of the key measurements of readiness uh, that we consider when we're evaluating the uh, credentials of a candidate. So on the slide uh, that you see in front of you now, you'll see a summary of the key measurements of readiness for which we will consider both the you know, credentials that are a part of your application portfolio, and then we'll later uh, incorporate into our overall review of readiness uh, the outcome of your interview. And so, you know, the common measurements of academic readiness, as you might imagine, uh, will begin with the candidate's undergraduate grade point average. And then we'll also be looking carefully at the overall strength of uh, the candidate's application essay as it relates to the usage of grammar and sentence construction. And we'll also be looking um, to the extent that uh, an applicant's references will be strongly endorsing uh, the candidate's overall readiness uh, for this, you know, advanced graduate study. So, you know, for those of you who are soon to be graduates of a bachelor's degree program, and that you know, represents the uh, majority of our candidates. Also, we have quite a few candidates who uh, just recently, you know, completed their bachelor's degree. They may have one or two years of uh, related, uh, you know, human services experience. The obvious and natural source of a reference uh, will be a current or former uh, professor from your undergraduate program, uh, perhaps an academic advisor or department chairperson, uh, also uh, supervisors of a field experience uh, that you had in your undergraduate program, either a practicum or an internship. All of these uh, references make for, for uh, all of these uh, you know, contacts uh, make for, for great you know, reference uh, you know, sources. And uh, then for the interview, uh, this activity uh, also plays a major role in, uh, you know, determining the outcome of your candidacy. And it basically, you know, provides candidates an opportunity to convey to the interviewer that uh, they possess a high level of commitment to, you know, completing the uh, degree program and that uh, they have a basic understanding of the professional role that they, uh, you know, aspire to become and that they you know, possess the appropriate level of emotional maturity and interpersonal skills that are you know, required for you know, career success. So on this slide here, you will see uh, a basic checklist of items that will you know, comprise your application portfolio. And our online application system will provide you with a detailed list of what documents that are you know, required for the program that you uh, that you will be uh, you know seeking admission to, and uh, in the handout section of this webinar, I've uploaded a uh, you know copy of the application guidelines. So that document gives you all of the details uh, with regard to the application due dates for the uh, various programs that we offer, and uh, also um, uh, we also in the uh, guidelines uh, have some. Uh, uh, answers to several commonly asked questions uh, about the process for, um, you know, applying for admission. So I think you'll find that 
uh, to be a very uh, useful uh, document. And also, um, I would uh, uh, you know, encourage everyone who is uh, thinking about submitting an application for admission uh, to reach out to me you know, personally. I'd be happy to talk with you about any uh, unique circumstances about your application portfolio that you would like to um, you know, discuss. And I'll hap I'm also happy to give you any tips about putting together the application essay. And also, if you're having any uh, your concerns about any of your you know, credentials, uh, you know, happy to uh, offer you some uh, some advice along those lines. And uh, just a reminder that uh, we are currently accepting applications for a spring 2021 and fall 2021 enrollment. Uh, you can start your application online uh, via our, our, our website. And I believe as uh, either Bruce or Robert mentioned, uh, we have some excellent scholarship opportunities available as well as some student employment opportunities. Uh, for example, in the clinical PsyD program, we have a number of teaching assistant opportunities as well. I think we have roughly about 25 teaching assistant um, positions in that department. Uh, and so we're happy uh, as a part of your um, uh, part of your journey to you know, becoming a student in our program to be able to offer you those opportunities as well. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to Sarah. Thank you, Joe. Um, so as we mentioned um, a few times, you can download all the slides in the handout section, um, and here's some contact information that I definitely recommend you take a moment to uh, download these slides in case you have any further questions, or as Joe mentioned, you wanna reach out um, with maybe some specific, you know, um, questions related to your experience or your application information, et cetera. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Do you want to stay there for just one sec? Okay. Um, so Dr. Julie Ryan is now the director of the CIFAR concentration in the doctoral program. Um, she's currently on maternity leave. So if you have questions about that, please write to me. And what's not clear here is that there's an underscore between the Bruce and the Ecker in that email address. It doesn't, doesn't show much the way this is done. Um, so feel free to reach out to me. And Robert, I'm sure you would invite people to reach out to you as well. Absolutely. And I'll add too that all this contact information is available on our website too. So you can go to williamjames.edu um, and find this information as well. Um, and there's also a lot of information on the website about the programs, the concentrations, the admissions process, um, you know, even information about upcoming events, news articles about uh, some of the great work that our students and our faculty are doing. Um, so I definitely encourage everyone to check that out as well. Um, so on the next slide, um, I'll just also add that we are also active on all of those social media platforms um, and have a bunch of different resources. Um, so definitely, um, if you're on any of those social media sites, definitely um, connect with us there and, you know, you can stay up to date on all the great work that we're doing here at the college. Um, yes, so any I, final thoughts? Yeah, I, I would just like to add uh, that uh, we do have uh, a virtual uh, open house coming up on Saturday, November 14th. And uh, if you would like to uh, join us for that virtual open house, you'll be able to meet with us via Zoom. And uh, we'll have several faculty uh, from all of our academic programs that will be available to talk to you in you know, real time. Uh, so uh, happy to have you join us if you have more detailed questions about uh, the many program offerings that we have. Uh, please do join us on Saturday, November 14th, and uh, there's a registration uh, for that on our website. If you just navigate to the admissions tab uh, on the uh, main webpage, you'll be able to um, uh, find the registration link, and we'd be happy to have you join us on Saturday the 14th. Great. Any last thoughts from Robert or Bruce? I, I have a hard stop now, but I wanted to just... Uh, welcome you and if I can be of any assistance in responding to any questions as you go through the application process, let me know and I certainly hope to meet many of you uh, as students next year. Thank you. And this is Bruce and I say ditto. Please um, feel free to reach out. Okay, great. Uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you folks. <laughs>